never get old. No. <laughs> I, would, I would like to hear all the girls give a beat and scream, please. Listen to billions of people all around the world. <laughs> Don't laugh at that, that's just me. <laughs> Hundreds of people around the world. Uh, but uh, we have a little tradition, which if you start out, you introduce yourself, uh, and I, I think you're familiar with a little piece of paper there, and then we're, we're off and running. Hi, my name is Paul McCartney. <laughs> and I feel wildly elated about being Conor O'Brien's friend. Oh my god. <laughs> That's it, good night, thank you. That's all I needed. Uh, oh, Paul, let's, uh, let's dive right into it. First of all, this book is extraordinary. You took these photographs, I think you got a Pentax camera, yeah. in 1963. Mm -hmm. I think you and all the fellas got Pentax cameras, but you were taking a lot of pictures, and then you forgot you had them. I kind of knew I had them, but I, I thought I'd lost them. Because <clears throat> in the 60s, you know, you, a lot of people used to leave their doors open. It was all a bit hippie, and you know, it was like, yeah, man. Um, That's your summation of the 60s, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I remember. That's all I remember. No, so I thought, well, I, yeah, I've lost them. But um, I was with uh, a photo archivist in London. Sarah Brown, who was uh, organizing an exhibition of Linda's photographs. And during it, I just said, well, you know, I took some pictures in the 60s. I said, but I have no idea where they are. She said, oh, yeah, we've got them. <laughs> I said, oh, right. let's have a look. So, yeah, it turned out there were like about 300 pictures. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. And it makes me think, what else do you have that you don't know about? <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> well, uh, there are so many photos uh, to look at, and there's so many. I look through the book, and I adore this book, and I've been through it many times, and the photos take me in different directions. Uh, they really are spectacular. Um, I wanted to start out with maybe technically not the most uh, proficient photo, but one that I think is the right place to start because you were new with the camera, you're trying something out. Let's put this up, and this is you. Playing, looking in the mirror, what does this bring back to you? Is this you toying with the camera, experimenting? Uh, yeah, I think so. You know, just um, the idea when you get the camera at first was to just take lots of pictures and then see if they turned out. And of course, it's not like digital, you had to wait. Yeah. So you, you took them. And then they went, in England, we, they went to the chemist, we called it. Right. And they go down and they develop it, and then, you know, about a week later, you get your pictures back. So, yeah, I think this is me just seeing what I can do. Right. And if I can smoke at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Uh, I would like to point out that I think when I talk to young people, when I talk to my kids today, they have no idea about the limitations with working with this kind of camera. We're all so used to the phone. Yeah. We can see it right away. Mm. And as you said, these came in rolls of maybe 36 photos. You take them, you don't know, and you also, it's not autofocus. You have to figure out what the f-stop is. You have to know all that stuff. Yeah. It's a whole different world. Yeah, it's, um, I like it. Yeah. You know, but it, it, as you say, it, it, it takes some getting used to. But we were lucky because we were often around photographers. Yes. You know, we would be taking pictures of us for this, that, and the other. And so you could talk photography to them, and you could say, what is the f-stop in this situation? And what, are you, what are you shooting? 400 ASA. Okay, well, that will be. And some of the rogues would say, f8 to the fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> Just screw with you, yeah. Just to screw with And you. also, they probably didn't want to give away a trade secret. That's probably true. Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, it, was, it was fun, you know. Yeah, I'm going to move us on because we have a bunch to see, and let's say hi to some of the lads. This is an amazing photo. Yeah. 
This is Liverpool, 1963. And what I what struck me about this photo is that we're, I'm so used to seeing photos where John and all of you are posing for the cameras or pulling a face or, or, or projecting that image. Because it's you taking the photo, mm -hmm. John is very unguarded. Yeah. I think that's the, the thing I noticed getting these photos back. Um, but it's just, it's as if I'm not there. Um, you know, so. He, yeah, you're right, he's unguarded. And he's, I noticed that during the exhibition in the book, um, he's, he's got this little habit of he's not biting his nails, he's just got a little, mm -hmm. he draws this all the time. So it's just great to be reminded of it. Because it was so long ago, I'd forgotten that he had that little, that's a John thing. So, uh, and you know, particularly because he's not here, it's so lovely for me to see these memories and just remind me of where we were, what we did um, in those days. You know, it also <clears throat> sticks out in a lot of these photos because there's a bunch of photos, and we'll see this, where I see sometimes nerves, a little bit of tension. And what's interesting is everyone in this room, myself included, we know how the story turns out. You, the Beatles, it, it's this spectacular success that's never been equaled in show business. We all know what happens. But especially in these early photos, you guys don't know yet what's going to happen. No. It's a mystery to you in these moments, and people are constantly saying to you, boy, you're a big hit in, in England, when's the bubble gonna burst? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I see that, this really picking up steam that I see in some of these photos, is it gonna work out? How long is this gonna last? Yeah, uh, exactly, yeah. Um, what I love about them, um, he said modestly, is, um, <laughs> is the innocence. Yes. Because we didn't know we were going to be famous, and we, were, we really wanted to be, um, but as you say, we didn't know, so there's this sort of, we're trying really hard. Mm -hmm. So if someone says, you know, the photographer's, hey, hit me up, look over here, you know, you would do it. There was no sort of moody like, oh, oh. that's for you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that comes over just all this uh, early innocence. Yeah, almost. There's a, there's a lovely uh, one here. I absolutely love this photograph. And I feel like you're <laughs> rapidly getting more sophisticated, you know, in the, 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 the blur, you know, the, the, the uh, vision of the now. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, uh, this is just a fantastic, and again, unguarded, I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, with the Beatles, we knew each other very well before all this happened. So, for instance, um, with George and with John on separate occasions, um, I would suggest that we went hitchhiking. So, I knew George as a hitchhiking mate. And again, you're talking about we didn't know what was going to happen, but you didn't know if you were going to get a lift. So, you shared all of that. You sit by the roadside, you know, just cursing the driver that wouldn't give you a lift. <laughs> and, uh, and loving the lorry driver who did, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's my little hitchhiking mate. It's funny that that's, uh, because it's so personal for you, I often forget how young you guys were. George is the youngest, I think he's 20. He here. Be, yeah. And you think about just how young all of you were. It's just, uh, yeah. I mean, it's mind boggling to me. Yeah, I mean, you know, 20 now, from this perspective, is like really young. Yeah. I mean, I've got grandkids older than that. Um, but we didn't think it was young. We thought we were kings of the universe. Yeah. We smoked cigarettes, man. <laughs> we had suits, eyes, uh -huh. guitars. Yes. We were cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Beatles cool or not, you know? I'm more of a Jerry and the Pacemakers guy, but all right. No one's ever said that to you, but no one ever will. Uh, I love. I think this next photo is a terrific photograph. It is, of course, Ringo. But look, at, I just love the way you have this photo. That's a gorgeous photograph. 
Yeah, um, thank you. Um, now, you know, as you said before, uh, everyone was unguarded. So, uh, with photography, what I learned to do was look for the light situations where there was something interesting. Um, and Ringo, like all of them, was actually, we were smokers. Yeah. And, um, but Ringo would do this trick. Ringo was like suave. Mm -hmm. he, he had like the best car, and he would drink like bourbon and seven up. <laughs> and, and when he would, uh, when he was going on a date with a girl, he put two cigarettes in his mouth and light them. Oh my God! And they give all to me. <laughs> if he didn't stick to his lip. <laughs> You know that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's that kind of guy. I've done that with gum, and they don't like it. <laughs> it's not quite so It's well. not the thing. No, don't try it. Uh, we have a photo here that I, I again, <laughs> and what's nice here is he's such a pivotal character, in, especially in these early years in your life. And I know what a complicated life he had, and in some ways what a tortured life he had. And you catch it in this moment of um, real, it just seems real, he seems at peace and happy. And I think that might be because you're taking the photo. Yeah, um, I was very happy to rediscover this picture, as I was with all of them. But something like this, uh, it just reminds you that um, the story about the Beatles manager, and, you know, coming to America and all that, he's just some guy. And we thought he was like very old, <laughs> he was he was all of thirty. So to us, that was like, um, but he he was a sweetheart, you know, and he was gay at, at a time when it was illegal. Okay. So um, you know, we'd be able to have very interesting conversations with him, um, and he was very open with us. And he, he was a great great guy, very nice man. And I think, like you guys, a little overwhelmed. It got so big so fast. And you, I've seen it in different documentaries. I think you're catching it here, which is just, you know, no one. He, you know, he had run a, he ran a record store just, you yeah. know, a few years before and met you guys. And then suddenly he's talking to the biggest people in show business and they all want a piece of you guys and he needs to figure it out, mm. which is, I must imagine, overwhelming. Yeah, but he handled it very well. Yeah. You know, he, he got into that role quite easily. He, he'd been to uh, RADA in, in London, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. So he was going to try and be an actor. Didn't work out. But he had a sort of showbiz thing. He had a style which he would, he would advise us with some tricks of the trade. You know, so that where the beat is at the end of every show, at the end of every show, would do the Wow, you know, that was the kind of thing Brian would say, that would look good. So we try it, yeah. and he was right. Yeah. It, it, it felt good, it looked good, but it gave us a little bit of something that um, other groups didn't have. That this next photo, I don't think anyone here is going to know anybody who's in this photo, but it's fascinating to me because I'm reminded when I look at this book that you're musicians, you're on a bill, uh, and here you are on the back to the side of the stage, and you're taking a photograph of a group called Peter J and the J Walkers. And I think they've been lost to us now, but it's fascinating to me to think about you guys waiting to go on. And there's another group, and they have a big saxophone player. <laughs> you guys opted not to go that route. <laughs> think of what you could have done with a saxophone player. Why don't you bring over with a big saxophone <laughs> You blew it. You blew it, man. <laughs> no, you know, you, the, you were on the package bills. Um, these days, it's pretty much the main act, and there might be a warm-up act. But then, uh, there was a lot of a lot of people on the bill because nobody did long. Now, you know, uh, people do three, four hours. I blame Bruce Springsteen. Yes. <laughs> I told him so. I said it's your fault. Yeah, he ruined it for everyone. He did. <laughs> you can't, uh, you can't uh, do an hour. We used to do a half hour. That was like the Beatles thing. Half an hour. Yeah. 
we got paid for. But um, I tried to work out why was it so short. Well, because there was a lot of people on the bill. And I think um, when you went to a thing, if you were a comedian, the promoter would say, how long can you do? Four minutes? Yeah. Can you do four minutes? And the guy would say, yeah, so you could do. So they would do four. So we thought, well, half an hour, that's like epic. <laughs> you know? so, but that was it. You know, big Beatles show, we were on and off like that. Um, it didn't seem strange. It also reminds me that there were many bands in Liverpool. Yeah. And then once you got out of Liverpool, there were many bands in England. So there's, the Beatles are constantly pushing away, even in 62, 63, you're pushing your way through a sea of other people mm -hmm. to get noticed. Yeah. Which I think people don't think about that now. No, there was a lot of action, you know. It was just a period, or well, you don't remember, it was after World War II. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was born, as was John and Ringo George, I think. Just missed it. Well, we were born during the war. So, you know, you look back on it, you think, God, imagine our parents somewhere like this, and this is a cinema, but there's bombs falling. Yeah. You don't, you can't cope with that, you can't realize, you know. Well, yeah, so we, we came out of that, and um, so it, it, it meant that you were striving now in this new world, yeah. and suddenly there were like groups and singers, and it was always very exciting going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rub it in. Uh, <laughs> I missed it all. You didn't? I, no, you weren't in a group? I wasn't in a group. I was in a group once years ago called the Bad Clams. Let's move on. <laughs> I love this shot. Again, you're backstage and I see George is twisted. I love the Beetle Boot in the foreground. And I also just love these peaks of backstage life. You're waiting, maybe there's some anxiety or you're bored. Um, there's that great, uh, I think, album in the background for the platters, but it just. Again, this is a view that no one else was getting. Yeah, I think that's the thing about these pictures. Um, and he's not going to be bothered to kind of look at me and do a small look, you know. Mm -hmm. He's like, it's always Paul just taking pictures, you know. So he ignores me, which um, was a great thing. It happened to us later when we would be um, with people like the Maisel's brothers, yeah. who are a New York team, just two, two brothers, Albert and David. And um, it turned out they were going to cover our visit uh, to New York. And so we said to them, what, what do you want us to do? They said, just ignore us. And that was like the greatest direction we'd ever had. Because you always had to ham it up for people, you know, all the I've seen, I've seen the footage in there. All these guys with thick New York accents, Beetle, Beetle, Beetle! <laughs> do this, point that way, do that, point this way! And you think, leave them alone. <laughs> you know, it's, it seems... You know, it's true we didn't mind. Yeah. Because we were in America, the land yeah. of music, and we were, we were just very flattered yeah. that these kind of hard-nosed press photographers yeah. um, wanted to take our picture, you know. And then at the end of the session, they'd say, hey, Beetle, Beetle, Beetle. One more, one more for the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, it was exciting. Yeah. It really was. Uh, and I don't think we minded it yeah. till later. Till later, yeah. Then we, the, the uh, I think, well, yes. gloss wore off of it. I think so. I think you earned the right very quickly, you guys, to say, I think we've had enough, we're moving on. Mm -hmm. uh, this next photo is fascinating to me because it's, it's a great photo and it's an oasis of calm. You're becoming incredibly famous, and you're living in an alley of your girlfriend's house, Jane Asher, and you live up in this attic. This is at the height of Beatlemania in England, and you take this photo out the back, and I think no one could have imagined that you were living in an attic, I think, with uh, Peter Asher, her younger sister. Yeah. Younger brother, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it was actually a very posh house. Yeah. It just had a not so posh view up over the back, you know. Yeah. Oh, this, 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 this is fantastic. It looks beautiful. It, it was very good. So, yeah. But this particular thing, this was out of my room. Mm -hmm. um, I was very lucky because I was going out with a girl called Jane Asher, and um, her mother was really nice to me. And I was missing home. And with the Beatles, we'd got a little flat in Mayfair. 
So I thought it was kind of cool. But I went to see it, and I, it was like soulless, you know. Um, so Mrs. Asher said, well, you can come and stay here, you know. So um, I did, I jumped at it. She was a great cook as well. Um, so yeah, so, but then the fans would find out that, so they were out in the street. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, so I had to try and figure out some way of getting out. So it was crazy. We knew this guy next door, you know, the house next door, who lived on this same uh, level. It was major somebody. It's like an army type lives on the other. So I would ring him and I'd say, I'm coming out. He said, Oh, okay. So we'd open his window and I walked along with this little, you know, kind of dangerous parapet and go in his window and then down in, his, in the lift to the basement and go out to the mews and escape. <laughs> <laughs> I love this major who's clearly an, an older gentleman. Picking up, the party's coming through. Gotta let him in. It's like it's another, and it's just a normal occasion. Yeah, I mean, he was, he was a very sweet guy, you know. But uh, it was very helpful. Yeah. Uh, well, this next one is not, you didn't take this, but it was taken clearly. It was taken with your camera. And um, mm -hmm. such a great dynamic shot of the two of you, you and John. And you can see, as hard as you worked, you always made it fun for each other, I think. That was yeah. the key ingredient. <clears throat> It, that's true. That's the thing I was saying about the hitchhiking and knowing each other before this. We'd established a sense of humor and a level at which we could make each other laugh. And John, of course, was very good at it. Um, this, this interesting with that big red mark yeah. um, is to show me that I like this, these photos. And these were taken off a contact sheet, mm -hmm. which kids these days don't know about. So you would get, take your 36 photos, and they would de be developed on a, all of them, the 36 shots, on one um, printer. So then you would go through it, mark them up, and you could get enlargements, etc. cetera. So um, I have a show in England at the National Portrait Gallery where we've shown some uh, contact sheets. And it is surprising how many people don't know what that is. Yeah. There's even sometimes in some of the photos that you put sprocket holes because that's how they advance the film with this little gear. Yeah. I don't think a lot of kids know what those are. No. They really make them seem like such a part of a very specific era. Yeah. We sure. have this. I love you guys go to. Things are really heating up. You go to Paris. This is you seeing a poster of yourselves for Les Beatles. Les, <laughs> Les Beatles. And um, what I love about this, and I don't think you can even see, but when you look closely, First of all, the photos that you're using in these posters were by an Astrid. Yeah. And you also have the old logo that you had for half a minute. The script, the Beatles, yeah. with the antenna coming yeah. out. Antenna. Before you went to that iconic drop T. But this is, feels to me like you saying, hey look, that's a poster of us. Yeah. It's exciting. Look at that. In Paris. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it, was, um, it was great. You know, we didn't expect Paris to have posters of us, because um, the French were a little late in getting the readers. You know, in England, like, there was a lot of screaming and the girls and stuff going mad for us. When we went there, it was quite sort of, you know, come on, prove yourselves. Um, so we did. We had to work it. Um, so yeah, it was exciting just to see us up in lights, as it were. Um, and the French, to this day, call me Paul McCartney. <laughs> <laughs> Clearing the throat, I yeah. think, more than anything else. <laughs> I love this photo of, uh, you got such a great shot, uh, John, George, and this is, I, I think I recognize this, it's from a very famous picture that you guys took outside the, the Olympia. Um, I think theater, bright blue bricks, and it's a very iconic shot of you guys, but I think you grabbed, a f this is probably in between takes with the photographer, and I think you might have grabbed this shot. Mm -hmm. And um, you can see, again, this is, 
you guys at work. This is in between, you know, yeah. in, in taking a photo session, and this isn't the, hey, we're the Beatles, it's guys working. Yeah. I mean, you know, seeing them after all these years, what good looking boys. <laughs> spectacular. What I love, another aspect of your perspective here is the world is looking at the Beatles at this point, but you're, you guys are looking back. And this is a great shot of what it was like to be you and the other guys. And actually the gentleman in the hat, very famous photographer, who took a lot of great snaps of you guys. Is that yeah. you? Dizzo? Dizzo Hoffman. Dizzo Hoffman. Yeah, who was uh, slow back. Um, yeah, he, he became a good friend, you know, so, uh, but he would get out with all the other photographers and snap us. But, um, yeah, we saw this a lot. Uh, and so I thought, well, yeah, I'll take a picture of them, it looks so good, you know, they're all lined up. Um, and yeah, but this, this was a daily occurrence. Yeah, you get used to this very quickly, but it, yeah. it's fascinating to, when you're being photographed, to turn the tables and say, I can do this to you, yeah, uh, which is really fun. And you see the look on their faces, they quite like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, this next one might be one of my favorite photos because of its honesty, and again, I think only you could get this, it's John. And again, writing... He's doing that thing again, yeah. And, and so I, I see vulnerability and I see some anxiety. It's, uh, I, yeah. I could be reading into it, but that's what it feels like to me. I don't know about the anxiety, but vulnerability is very true. Mm -hmm. um, and at this time, I didn't really know that. Um, later, when I thought, as an adult, about John's upbringing, he had a really tragic life, really. Because, um, you know, as a kid, his mother was decreed to not be good enough to bring him up. Uh, Julia, his mom, who we would visit, we loved her. We wrote a beautiful song about her. Um, but she uh, had, had to give him up. Uh, the father, Alf, mm -hmm. had left the home when John was three. Yeah. So that's not too wonderful. Um, and so John grew up with these sort of the minor tragedies throughout his life. Um, <clears throat> he was taken in by his aunt Mimi mm -hmm. um, and was brought up by her. But well, one night, mum, Julia, was visiting them, come to see her son, and on the way home, she got run over, got killed yeah. by apparently was an off duty cop mm -hmm. who maybe was a bit inebriated. It never came out, of course. They, they cover it up. But so John was having that, you know, taking off his mom, his mom dies, it, you know. Uh, so it made me realize why he had that vulnerability. Yeah. Um, I always admired the way he dealt with it. Because I'm not so sure I would deal that well with the stuff he went through. Yeah. Also, you have a, it's him with his glasses on. These are very thick glasses. Yeah. yeah, and uh, that was something that was kind of verboten as shots of John with his glasses on and the <clears> photographers <throat> around. But it's you, so he can have his glasses. Yeah, yeah that's it's really sweet. But he he was um, very short sighted, as you can see with the, the glasses. But right. um, I'm sorry, I, I advanced. That's okay. Uh, uh, if you can just spoil my story, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. That was the idea. Please, Paul. Please, Paul, there's no time for your story. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear you talk about John. <laughs> Look what I can do. He's gone back. I did that. <laughs> did you have more? Lots. <laughs> but I'm not telling you now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, screw it. Okay, I'll tell you one. <laughs> You're making a fool out of me. 
Sí, sí. <risa> short-sighted. He used to come down from his house, which was a mile or two away from where I lived, and we would write songs and, and have a little session. And this occasion, it was Christmas, and um, then John, after we finished, he would walk back up in the dark to his place. And um, I knew the route he took, and it was a place called Booker Avenue, and on the corner was this little, kind of little posh bungalow. So he walks home, and uh, then he, we talk the next day. He said, "He said, you know that that house on the corner, of Booker Avenue." So I walked past it. He said, "Those people are crazy." I said, Why? What do you mean? He said, "Well, they were out. You know what time was it? We finished midnight." He said, "They were out on the veranda, on the porch, playing cards at midnight." And I said, "I don't get it." So I went up and looked. It was. It was the manger, it was the baby Jesus. <laughs> it was a little British classic. <laughs> and a baby won all the money. <laughs> all right, now we talk about, again, you've got an unguarded uh, Ringo, and again, we're seeing this backstage life. And a little pensive, waiting. And yeah. this is you, a technique which I think you really liked, which is you could surprise people, you could catch them if you shot into a mirror. Mm -hmm. Early paparazzi. <laughs> so it's your fault, isn't it? <laughs> no, you're right, you know, it's just, I, I knew Ringo was just being natural. Mm -hmm. He was acting naturally. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, I knew you know, I could get that shot yeah. without him looking over and going over. So yeah, there was a lot of this backstage. And again, the light was quite nice, you know, so, so it was a good shot to try and take. This one is kind of spectacular to me because there's a flurry of activity and it's a great shot to me because it feels like John is almost pulled into himself. Mm -hmm. Things are heating up, it's getting crazier and crazier and he seems like he's just trying to be zen. Yeah. I think you have to be, you know, because there was a lot of craziness going on. And um, you had to take that moment for yourself. But the good thing was, he knew no one would be worried. It's not like anyone would say, come on, John, lively up. You know, he could just knew, he could just sit there. And as I say, I always admired that about John. Um, you know, now I realize I was like a big fan of John's. We all were, actually, in the group. He was like a very cool guy, you know? Very witty, very funny, but also very deep um, and real. So these photos show that from an early age. We have one. You are underrepresented, obviously, because you're taking the photos. <laughs> mm -hmm. But someone took this photo with your camera, and I love it. It's backstage, and. Um, I've never looked that good. Uh, <laughs> and I think we know that. But I also love, this almost feels Victorian, that wallpaper, that light switch. Yeah. This is, um, you know, a different, it's, it's show business from a different era. You guys were changing all the rules, but you're still in those dressing rooms. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we, I always think we were on the cusp because often we'd play on uh, a bill and there would be people from the previous era, and we were like the rock group. Mm -hmm. This is the modern thing, you know. But there were plenty of like jugglers, and uh, yeah, strange people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we were in that world, um, which I liked. Yeah. I liked coming out of that and sort of emerging. I mean, now, you know, you go to a show, and it's all rock and roll. You know, maybe it's a rock and roll show. But then you got all sorts of different acts. So, um, yeah, so it was interesting. It made it interesting for us that you, you wanted to chat to some of these people, you know, and see um, what life was like for them. What's funny is you came out of that, it really was the English music hall tradition, That's which I think influenced the music too. You guys yeah. came from that 
world, which have been around since the turn of the century. Yeah, and we'd grown up with that. Yeah. And then suddenly rock and roll hit, and we were now going to take it further in a different direction. But yeah, we'd grown up with that. My dad used to actually operate the limelight, the spotlight, and as a, a theater in Liverpool called the Hippodrome. And um, it was a limelight, which not many people know, was a piece of lime that you lit and it burned phosphorescent. And then you, it, that went through a lens and became the limelight beam. I had no, I've never heard that. Oh, I know. It's a sort of educational show. <laughs> well, I think you assumed that I didn't know anything. <laughs> no, so he You're was in that you? world, yeah. you know, he was in that world. And um, so it went right back to all the old musical acts, you know. And so he knew a lot of the songs. And he would go home to his sisters uh, in the interval, the two houses. He'd go home and he'd sing the songs to them. They'd remember them. So they said, well, we'll come out to the family singing songs. And also, he would take home programs for the event that people had left. And he would take them home and the girls would iron them make them new again, and he'd take them back and them. <laughs> From a sense of enterprise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was that world. Yes, As you're saying, it was a whole different world. That's what I, when you arrived backstage and I saw you go into your dressing room, and I think, well, some things just don't change. Here you are, another dressing room, putting on a show. It's, uh, it's exhilarating it's, uh, it's still to be part of that tradition. Yeah, I feel very lucky. Yeah. With that, you know, because so many of your mates at school went on and did uninspiring things. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> so, you know, you felt very lucky. To, to it must be tough when you show up at a high school game. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did pretty well. <laughs> I've got a nice hardware store. I think I did as well as it. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> it's a <party. laughs> We have a picture here I adore. Um, yeah, this is uh, John wearing many hats. George. I mean, sorry, George. I get them all confused. Um, <laughs> you're the drummer, right? Uh, but I love it. it's that sense of comedy too. Of don't don't play the don't play the joke. You know, there is nothing funny happening here. Right. It's the funniest way to be. I'm going to wear these two hats and I'm going to give you the most serious look in the world. Yeah. I know. George is very good at that. Uh, he, yeah, you know, he had a good deadpan sense of humor. Uh, and these hats were just lying around. Um, they're probably the dancers. Mm -hmm. Hats looks like the kind of thing that dancers would get a cane, one of those hats, and a scanty costume, and Joel starts dancing. Yeah. So he picks up the hats. That's, you know, that's the show business you're in. There's some dancers here, I'm going to take these hats and move around. Yeah. Um, this looks like. I know, and this is, I believe, you're in a recording studio in, I believe it's in Paris. Yeah. And this looks like a Chet Baker album cover. It's absolutely, yeah. it's a stunning photograph. And it's these musicians, um, you, were, and you, were, you guys are ushering in a whole new era of music, but you're still working alongside these other guys. Yeah. And it's funny, I never knew who these guys were. I just, it was, I think it was a rehearsal hall. Mm -hmm. And I never knew, I just liked, that looked so cool, you know, I just took the picture. Um, but I never knew till very recently who they were or what was going on. And um, it turns out Elvis Costello texted me just the other day and he said he's got an amazing text from a friend of his who was called Ray. And Ray said, uh, I got the book and on page 161 there's this photo of my dad playing guitar. <laughs> oh, he said, my heart skipped a beat. So now we know who that was, that's Ray's dad. <laughs> now things really pick up. This is the famous flight, Pan Am 101. You are going to uh, New York City. 
And you don't know what you're going to find when you get to New York City. You know you have a, you're on the charts, number one hit. You're going to do the Sullivan Show. We all know what happens. <laughs> but you guys, on the way over, you don't know. America's the big prize. The country's in mourning after JFK's assassination, which is two months earlier. What are you going to encounter? Is it going to work? Yeah, exactly. You know, so we were very excited just to be on a plane to New York. You know, that's like enough. But uh, what happened was the pilots always radio ahead to Idlewild, as it was then, right. before it was named Kennedy. Um, and so the word got back to us that there's a, there's a big crowd at the airport. You know, oh, well, <laughs> getting exciting. Um, so, yeah, we kind of half knew what to expect. But then it was a really good crowd. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, we, we were just bowled over. Yeah. Um, it was America, where all the music that we loved came from. Mm -hmm. um, so we were just happy to be there. And then with a big crowd of admirers, screaming girls, <laughs> um, it was great. And then what was nice after that, immediately we did a press conference at the airport. And it was like, hey, you know, all that again. Um, but we knew that whatever they laid on us, if there was any sort of insult, we knew we could come back with, well, we're number one in your country. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. <laughs> That's called a mic drop. Yeah. Uh, this is what you encounter when you get there. And I love this photo you took. We've all seen, of course, the other side of it, but this is what you guys saw outside the, the plaza, mm -hmm. which is absolutely amazing. And again, mm -hmm. probably you would see this in Europe, but to, to realize that this is happening in New York City, yeah, it's got to just be uh, incredible. It was great. Well, the whole thing too, the, the fans um, at the police, the policemen, and you know when you see some other photos. They've got the old-fashioned police yes. uniform with yeah. the big uh, buttons. And there were mounted police, too. Um, so it was very exciting for us to sit in a car and look. It was like looking, being in a movie. Mm -hmm. And of course, every time I drive down Fifth Avenue, I tell everyone that story. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, because you are tourists. Think about it. Yeah. I think George had been uh, to New York once. But the rest of you are tourists, and this is your first view of New York City. Mm -hmm. Not many people encounter this when they show up in New York. That's not what it's always like. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course I do, but, uh, <laughs> and me. Uh, this I love, Columbus Circle. I was there this morning, and I knew I'd be talking to you, and I've read the book 50 times, because uh, I adore it. I love how different it is now, and I can see that you're starting to take pictures of signage. You're taking a lot of, sort of, uh, these almost still lifes. It, it's, a, it's a different idea now that you're playing with, which is, this yeah. is America. I mean, you know, you're just taking photos, so you're not necessarily taking portraits. Mm -hmm. You're just taking anything that appeals to you. Um, so, to me, that's, that's America. Um, and it actually, on that little needle that's on the thing, it's a weather thing. And it's, it's always telling the temperature. And you can see there's one little bit that's worn away. So that must be like the most popular temperature. <laughs> <laughs> it's the number one temperature in the country. Number, yeah. uh, I just like the picture, you know, so I took it. You guys, this is a great shot of the amazing Ronnie Spector of the Ronettes. It reminded me of. Uh, Something I don't think can be stressed enough is what, what you guys did when you landed is you completely gave it up for girl groups. And uh, you were a group that um, played a lot of songs by girl groups and promoted them. Mm. And they were songs that you loved. Mm. Ringo would sing boys, didn't even change the gender. You know, mm. it's just, we're going to sing Please Mr. Postman, Baby It's You. Yeah. Um, and that was, I think at the time, unusual. When everyone was asking you guys, what do you love? And you said, we love these girl groups. Yeah, well, mostly black American music, really, mm -hmm. except for, you know, if you like Elvis and Carl Perkins and things. Um, so, yeah, we love these girl groups. And as you say, Ringo sang boys, we never thought, you know, that's strange. Um, it just was a great song. Yep. Um, so we just liked the, how it sounded. I don't think we really 
worried about what the lyrics said. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a great for us to meet Ronnie. Wow. All your heroes are turning yeah. up and they want to meet you guys. Yeah. It's true. Um, this one is also from inside. It's a double exposure of John. I was struck with, you guys are slobs. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, but we, you know, we got time off. <laughs> well, that's a slob. It'd be unusual if it was a slob. This is a, yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, this is a shot, we've seen so many shots from different angles of the Sullivan set, but this is what struck me. Look at how small the riser is for Ringo's drum band. <laughs> and as a guy who I started out as a bad drummer before I moved on to bad guitar and then bad comedy, what I <laughs> what struck me about this is guitars. I mean, drums move when you hit them. It's a miracle he didn't fall off. <laughs> That's he's Ringo. <laughs> Ringo didn't fall off. He didn't fall off. No, but I agree. I mean, how did he get up? Yeah. It's like, did he jump? <laughs> or was he lifted? I don't know. It's all, this raised so many questions for me. Uh, I, but it, it does make me, in retrospect, terrified for him on that solo appearance. That he, the drums didn't just fall off in the middle of the first song. He used to have a, a hard job with all that stuff. We played in Washington. Yeah. And um, for the first time ever, they said, you're going to play in the round. We didn't even know what they were talking about. But there was like a little round stage in the middle of the room. I, you know, I now know it's to get more people in. Yes, that's why they were doing it. But um, they said, well, you'll have, to, you'll have to play to these people, then you'll have to turn around and play to those people. Then those people will have to. So we just about managed it. We'd sort of move our amps and so Ring had to move his whole trunk. His <laughs> eyes didn't move. There's footage of this, and it's ridiculous because you're the biggest act in the history of the world, and, and in between songs, Ringo's jumping down, and it's like he's moving somebody into their dorm room. You know? It's ridiculous, and there's no one running out and doing it for him, and he's pushing, and shoving, and you guys are like, "Come on, Ringo, let's go." <laughs> Did it. Yeah, you did. You did what you had to do. This uh, photo you took out the window, it is miraculous, I think. It's, it's such an angelic shot of this. Yeah, I love this picture. Her looking in at you and you looking out. Yeah. And um, she's ethereal, you know? She's really. She really is. She's uh, so serene. And, you know, normally we'd see people like this and they'd be sort of. Shouting or screaming or waving. <laughs> she's just got this very cool look. Yeah. It's like um, so you, you want to paint a portrait. She's got the head scar. Yeah. And uh, I wish I knew her story. Yeah, it's really nice. Knows, you know, maybe one of these days someone will so say that was my auntie. <laughs> but um, we'll be yeah. Elvis Costello. <laughs> <laughs> I know her too. <laughs> He's such a liar, that guy. <laughs> he texts me all the time, too, Paul. <laughs> I don't believe a word of it. <laughs> After Sullivan, as you said, you, got, you guys go down to Washington, D.C., and I love this photo because so much of your art, so much of your music is about working people, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and barbers, Eleanor Rigby, firemen, nurses, poppy on tray. You have this way, and I love this photo because you're looking out the window, you're at the eye of this hurricane, and you see this man, and you take this photo, and you seem drawn to people uh, that are out there doing their job, and he's anonymous. Yeah, because um, that's my world. You know, growing up in Liverpool, mm -hmm. these are the people you knew, and you hung up with, um, you hung out with. Um, also, I mean, I could have just been, in Liverpool, I could have just been to the right, clearing up after him. You know, I mean, these, that could be my own call. Uh, so I, I, it, it isn't, but um, it's Ray's uncle. No. <laughs> no, but you know, I just, I'm drawn to yeah. 
people's, working people's faces, they, they just look good. And also, the other thing I'm drawn to them for, people tend to think working class people are a bit stupid. You know, he's, well, look at the job he's got, he's been you know, too stupid. But some of them, you know, if you know them, you kind of, you, you visit their houses, or like my uncles and aunties, they can be really clever people. And I love that. I mean, I, I had a, an uncle who was really, all right, you know, what are you on? He's got a little bull, he don't talk like that, like, you know. Um, so you would have thought, well, he's a bit thick. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't. People might have thought. Yes, yes. But, um, but he was great. And uh, I would bring homework uh, home from school, and he was the one in the family who would know the Shakespeare. And the epic poems, yeah. he just, he'd been taught it and he'd remember it all. So these hidden depths are what I love mm -hmm. about working people, never underestimate them. Well, we move on, you, this is, we're now getting to Miami. You land in Miami. And John once had a quote, he said that the early Beatles touring days were like a Fellini film, satiricon, just madness. And here you really see it, because you get this book and you look up close, there are beauty queens, yeah. there are I mean, all kinds of, uh, just insanity. There are all these people there and you're thinking, why are these people here? Yeah. And, uh, you know, what about, what about the guy or girl? In the hat, though, with the sort of leopard skin thing. Oh, check this out. I saw the same thing and I wanted to punch in on this. Look who's greeting you, <laughs> holding, I don't know if you can see this, holding a chimpanzee. <laughs> but why? <laughs> I, you know, I think we appeal to everyone. <laughs> I just love this moment. I know, it's not one. And I mean, on the day, I just took the picture, but I couldn't ever see that detail. Right. Until the book and uh, God bless. I I saw that and I thought this photograph captures. Yes, this is Beatlemania. <laughs> and then we had to call the monkey to clear the photo, <laughs> which did not go well. This is a fascinating photo because um, you are zeroed in on the fact that this is not something you saw. No. In England, you didn't see it in Liverpool, you didn't see it in London. This is not. This was new to you. Yeah, no. This is when we arrived in Miami, and we had a police escort, um, and this guy on the motorcycle just pulled up right beside us, and I had a camera, so I just snapped this picture of him because I was so um, amazed at seeing like a gun, an ammo. Because in England, we were very lucky. The cops don't have guns. So, this was not. <laughs> well, we were very lucky in that respect, you know. It's, um, yeah, our laws never included the Second Amendment. But, um, yeah, so I was fascinated by this guy, you know, and the gun and everything. And I didn't want his head. I just wanted that bit, you know, just to, um, remind myself of what America was like. Um, this is, I just love this uh, girl here. <laughs> in the center, and to me that says it all. I've never made anyone that happy. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. And I mean, when I, again, like I said, took the picture quickly in the car, and drove into the hotel. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, then I discovered her when I looked at the picture. Yeah. I can almost hear her screaming. Yeah. <laughs> and it, Today I should be medicated. Say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the parents would be like, no, 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 everything for you, but it's not, it's not like an unbelievable moment. It's just the looks on all the people's faces. You've got the kid there who's come from school, he's got his books, mm -hmm. you know. A girl along there doesn't quite know what to think of it. And then the cop, who's ready to blow his whistle. Yeah. <laughs> He's ready. <laughs> <laughs> he 
still hasn't blown the whistle all these years later. No. <laughs> well, now it's the Wizard of Oz. You switch to color. And you guys suddenly hit Miami, which must have felt like a dream, because now you are at the top of show business. You're, it, 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 the reviews are in. 78, 80 million people watch the, you guys on Sullivan. The world's going crazy. And then you hit this incredible walk in Miami. Yeah. And you're having fun. You're relaxing. Yeah, we were very lucky. And I think Brian was, uh, Brian Epstein was uh, instrumental in that. He, he always put in a little bit of leisure, even though we worked crazy uh, days, I don't know, like 300 days a year, probably. But he would always put in, like, a visit to the beach. Yeah. You know, and um, th we were really thankful. So this is, they hired a boat, and we just went out for the day. And um, it was so good, because after that, you wouldn't mind doing a show. Right. You right. know, you felt so good. Um, You're here to do another Sullivan appearance, but down in Miami, which, you know, suddenly everything is different, and I think, see that in this photo. <laughs> oh yeah. Which is, oh, no, no. I mean, that's an album cover. That is the, <laughs> that is such a spectacular photo of, of George. And are we thinking that's a, would that be a rum and coke, a scotch and coke? Like, what do you guys have? I think it was a scotch and coke, yeah. yeah. That's what we were. But uh, no, that is George living the life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, he, he took to it very well. Yes. <laughs> so he's got the tan, he's in Miami, he's got the tan. He's got a girl, a beautiful girl in a sensational bikini. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, designer, I would have to tell Stella about that. <laughs> <laughs> he's got the sea, he's got the drink, he's got the shades. Oh my god, yeah. It looks like he's got some suntan lotion on. Uh, it's all good. It's yeah. all good. All good. Yeah, that photo makes me very happy. Um, and these next ones are just you guys rehearsing. Well, actually, you're getting ready to rehearse. This is, uh, this is, of course, Ringo. And there's a lot of Beatles paraphernalia. He's wearing a, like a Beatles souvenir hat yeah. that someone handed to you. And he said, all right, I'll put it on. It's a good hat. Yeah, it's a good hat. It's free. <laughs> Do you still have any of that stuff, that free Beatles no, stuff they gave you? No, I don't. Well, it probably turned up one of yeah. those. It's in there. It's in that little rocker somewhere. somewhere. No, the, the nice thing about the, this stuff in this series of photos, uh, the hotel provided you with, you know, normally you'll get a robe yep. or a dressing gown to go in a hotel. They had these little cherry towel jackets. Yes. Very cool. I think you see we, them next because yeah, you guys are rehearsing. We didn't take them off. No. <laughs> in all the rehearsal shots, yeah. you can see that you guys. <laughs> are wearing. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't wear them for the next three albums. <laughs> and just a shout out to, that's Mel, that's Mel Evans. Mel, yeah. Mel was a, a lovely man who was our roadie, and a uh, big bear of a man. Mm -hmm. And he was a sweetheart, you know, he just, uh, he, he loved us and we loved him. You know what's incredible too is, uh, you look at what a band travels with today, the, there hasn't been a band nearly as big as you guys since, and yet your entourage is very small. Yeah. It's mind-boggling <coughs> by today's standards. Two. Yeah, two people, Mal and Neil. Yeah, taking care of instruments, hotel rooms, in and out, taking care of everything, baggage. Yeah. And uh, one of them was here, with you, that is, of course, George Martin, and I believe his fiance. She was fiance at the time, and she, she, they later got married. Uh, Judy Lockhart Smith. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Very posh. Um, <laughs> she's she's still alive. She's a lovely, lovely lady. Well, she is Lady Martin now. Yeah. Because George was knighted, but um, they were they were great. They were a lovely couple. And uh, of course, George was a brilliant man. Mm -hmm and a um, great producer. I mean, he also had a fantastic sense of humor, so um, he and Judy got on very well. And uh, yeah, 
They, they were great cool. Also, I just have never seen a photo. I don't think I've seen him uh, in a bathing suit. It's just such a, <laughs> I am always seeing him iconic, even late in the Beatles days when everyone else is wearing whatever, he's always suit and tie suit proper, better, yeah. um, you know, EMI, this is the way we do things. And so this picture was, I thought, very arresting for that reason. Yeah, well, it's, uh, there's a later picture where he's, he's got Judy, he's gonna throw her in the pool. Yeah. But um, that was lovely, you know, just having these moments of leisure. Yeah. And then these friends of ours who were on the trip could uh, uh, join us with them. This photo was so funny. You're there, I think, on the beach. <laughs> and you see an ad go by. And you take a picture of it. There is only one Mr. Pants. <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> have you ever seen another Mr. Pants? I have not. But I love the idea that Mr. Pants decided, I'll buy an ad. We'll have the plane fly by where the Beatles are. Maybe one of them will take a photograph and show it 60 years from now. And I'll get some free advertising. Uh -huh. oh, so what do you think it was? Like a trouser phone? Mr. Pants? Yes, it's gotta be trousers. <laughs> Back, back in the day, trouser firms, as we called them. <laughs> We're all the rage. You know, trousers? Yeah. It's a trouser firm. <laughs> you made it sound like a law firm. I love it. <laughs> Welcome to the trouser firm. <laughs> this is one of my favorites because it's George as happy as anyone could possibly be. Yeah. In the towel in general. In the towel. <laughs> You know, like I say, you've got to imagine my joy yeah. at first of all rediscovering this and then seeing this. Yes. It just, you know, it just takes you back. Yep. Like your family snapshots, but these are shots, my family snapshots, they're of the Beatles. And um, just so lovely to capture a moment of George like that. Yeah. You know, you, you don't kind of see him like that. Yeah. Uh, and we were on, on a boat in Miami. And we were loving it. And then I'm going to end on the photo that's on the cover. Oh, that, no, I'm sorry, there's one more to go. I wanted to get in uh, the one before we. Uh, we uh, it's me being, it up. being horrified by the fact I've caught a fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't intend to catch one, you got one. And I think you put it back. I did put it back in, in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> Already, the, 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 the inner vegetarian in yeah, the same. Totally. This will not work for me. You may go, fishy. You may go. Yeah. And then I yeah. wanted to end on this one. This is the cover shot. Just for fun, I walked over there today. It was amazing how much it's uh, changed. But also, what's still the same. And I looked at this photograph and I thought, there you are. I think shooting out the back of the window. I think you're on your way to the plaza, maybe from the end but just the fact that you had the presence of mind to take some photos while all this was happening is miraculous to me. Mm. It's a great shot. Well, thank you. You know, the thing is, we were so fascinated being in America, seeing American life, American cars, American buildings, New York. So, yeah, you know, if people are running up the street, that's, to us, that was fascinating. You know, wow, we've made it. Well, I, um, I want to make sure that I uh, wrap this up. I have to tell you that I have been lucky enough to be in my business now for 30-some-odd you know, years. I get to talk to everybody. I can't think of a single person who's brought more joy to more people than you. And, uh, Thanks for doing this, Conan. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is a 
an absolute joy and a thrill and can't think of anything cooler than to get to spend an hour with you and uh, look at these photos. So I think on behalf of everybody here, I want to say thank you all the time.